Thanks so much for being here today. It is an absolute honor to be introducing uh, Dr. Denis Lebian, um, who is a physician scientist widely recognized for his work in developing extremely innovative methods for MRI. With, these, with the application of these methods to um, questions of scientific and clinical importance. Um, so Dr. Lebian is the in, it has invented diffusion MRI, um, which is the method that is used to study white matter in uh, the brain and has been applied to a wide range of diseases um, and depicts um, uh, brain tissue in, in uh, cases where it is important to determine whether or not it's still salvageable um, and has a, a many, 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 many uh, different applications and an impact in the field. Uh, we're going to hear a lot about it uh, in his talk, but anyway, uh, it's really amazing to have him uh, speak here today. Um, he's an inventor on many different patents. Um, the applications that um, that have been pioneered by uh, Dr. Lebian have uh, expanded outside the brain, especially for oncology and breast, prostate, and liver cancer. He's the founding director of Neurospin, which is an ultra-high field MRI facility with a 11.7 uh, Tesla whole body MRI magnet. So we have a seven Tesla here, but this is 11.7. And it's located in uh, Saclay, uh, France, near Paris. Um, I had the um, opportunity to visit this facility last year during ICMRM. They graciously invited some scientists to come visit. And I was completely struck by the magnificence of both the science, but also the architecture of this facility that was nestled away in the countryside a little outside of France. Um, so that was an amazing experience, and thank you, uh, Dr. Lebian, for that. Um, so uh, he's a full member of the Institut de France um, Academy of Sciences, has received many international awards, and um, this includes the gold medal for the International Society for Magnetic Resonance and Medicine, um, the Lounsbury Award from the uh, U.S. National Academy of Sciences and the French Academy of Sciences, and is the recipient of the outstanding Louis D. D Louis, Louis D. Award of the Institut de France. Um, and um, it is a pleasure to introduce him. And uh, without further ado, Dr. Lebrihan. Uh, it's a terrific honor for me to be here today. And uh, I really thank you so much uh, for, being, for being with you. Um, uh, it's a little bit emotional, I have to say, because it's such a famous uh, institution in the world. And uh, so I do my best to uh, give you some uh, um, new directions that I have uh, tried to pursue over, over the last uh, uh, years. Especially, uh, I'll show you about uh, this 11.7 uh, Tesla MRI system. So first, innovation, I think, is something that uh, is very intriguing. Um, um, I, I, do I have a pointer, or I use a mouse? Uh, use a mouse. The mouse? Okay, yeah. Yeah, 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 perfect, perfect. And I think there are two ways. Uh, there is uh, progressive Im improvement until a radical change occurs, or I think it is uh, maybe more frequent, something which has been developed without medical purpose, and suddenly it becomes interesting for medicine. So the very first example is the discovery of X-rays, uh, which made radiology possible. And the, um, the combination of uh, X-rays and uh, computer science made the CT to be uh, available. The second example is NMR, which had nothing to do with, uh, with medicine at the beginning, physics and, and chemistry. And as you know well, uh, many, many years later, uh, this uh, concept gave uh, birth to MRI. So we have to be ready for surprises because we, this cannot be predicted. The other great scientist that uh, uh, we have to consider for, for us, for imaging, is Albert Einstein. Um, his paper on, uh, on the photoelectric effect, of course, has a great importance for nuclear imaging. 
His work on a theory of diffusion led to uh, diffusion MRI and DTI. And uh, what may be not so known, because in fact it's completely new, I'll show you that it might be that the relativity theory, in addition to diffusion, might help us to build a, a gauche theory to explain how the human brain works. So, uh, let's start with uh, the universe, <laughs> to go down to our brain. Um, the universe is, universe is made, we believe at least, of matter and dark matter and energy. And physicists have enjoyed good theories, electromagnetism, relativity, and so on. Um, they have great instruments. It's research instruments, for instance, they could see uh, black holes. It's very sort of work. Very interesting. We, yesterday, I was very impressed by the art pieces uh, that you had. This is, uh, this is a neuron. This is a galaxy. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the number of neurons we have in our brain is very similar to the number of stars we have in the galaxy. Of course, there's no relationship. But uh, we have gray matter, white matter. Maybe some people have uh, black holes. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, um, and we have also instruments. So could we build a brain gauge theory for, for the brain? So we need instruments uh, exactly the same way as uh, physicists have, uh, astrophysicists have instruments. And the good point, and what I like here, it's not good to get grants, but um, uh, you, you, you get money from grants to build something to answer a question. But in fact, what is the most fun is to make an instrument, a great instrument, to discover something you have no idea, right? But you cannot write that for a grant. Okay. okay, I want to do that. I don't know what I will get with it, but let's do it. No, it, it, it doesn't work, right? So, uh, but I, I hope, I hope at least 50% of what we get with such instruments, we are, we are not aware today. So we have to keep our eyes open. So I uh, will talk uh, only on the brain today. And the brain, as you know well, is a multi-scale uh, architect functional architecture, you know uh, that we have many regions, uh, and also that uh, we have, um, th this is quite interesting philosophically also, that our brain is organized to, to encode space, so each location of, of uh, some cortices are linked to some special places in, uh, in the environment. And uh, with, um, with MRI, with functional MRI, for instance, if we look at the um, retinotopic organization of the visual cortex, we can guess, for instance, here you have uh, some volunteers who are um, thinking about big letters, and by looking at the fMRI images, we can read their mind, if we can say so, uh, so guess the letters that they are producing. So this is what I call the microscopic scale, and uh, uh, with MRI especially, we can identify more than what uh, Broadman has uh, uh, shown, uh, about 200 of those regions. And you will see later why it is important. The second uh, level so is a mesoscopic scale, and uh, I take the visual cortex because that's the, the most known organization, with layers and columns to encode uh, the visual world. And with a uh, 7 Tesla MRI, because you have a 7 Tesla MRI machine, we, are, we, we could see this organization even in the human brain. Now, if we go to an even lower level, the microscopic level, we know, of course, uh, thanks to Cajal, we will talk about him also later, but we have neurons. The neurons communicate through synapses, which means that we have to consider uh, neurochemistry and, and genetic. But the the important point is that we need all this uh, scaling in order to understand how the brain works. So it's not just the different levels. They are, uh, they are interacting with each other. And we need to have some, uh, if we have a model, we need to take into account all of that. So the problem today is that if we talk about uh, physics instruments, you know, the luminosity, the CERN, for instance, in Geneva, um, has a luminosity ha which has increased, which led to the discovery, of, not the discovery, but the, um, the visualization of the Higgs boson, if I would say so. But up to seven Tesla, uh, so this is very well seen. This is borderline, but then nothing. So by going to high field, such as 11.7 uh, Tesla, I'll talk about, 
um, we have perhaps a way to look at this microscopic world. Um, in physics, it's very simple. The nuclear magnetization, so which is used to make the signal of MRI, scales with B0, which is the field of the magnet. So in 2000 and 2001, uh, I was already in, uh, along these lines, and uh, because I am at the French Atomic Energy Commission, where they make uh, magnets for, for the CERN, for instance, in Geneva, they made 400 magnets for the LHC and the Higgs boson uh, discovery. They are making also nuclear fusion magnets. So I knock at the door and I say, could you make 11.7 uh, Tesla for me? So uh, <laughs> they were very surprised. Um, it's high field, in fact, even for particle physics. But the big problem is that we have big bodies. So we, we need uh, uh, homogeneity on a very wide volume and also stability. But they agreed. They said, OK, it's a challenging project. Let's do it. So I was very happy. But when I started to talk about it, uh, many of my colleagues, especially in the US, considered that was completely crazy. It was not possible to make 11.7 uh, uh, Tesla. So that was in 2001. Now, if we look at the landscape in 2019, this is where we are. So <laughs> you see that the number of systems is, has increased a lot. In uh, Minneapolis, they have a 10 and a half Tesla. NIH just received a uh, head only 11.7 Tesla. Um, uh, in, in Korea, they will get one in, uh, in the next weeks or so, I think. And in the US, they are project for 14 or 20 Tesla. So when I talked to my colleagues recently, I said, you see, it was not so crazy as you said. And they said, no, 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 you, you are crazy. But the problem is that you have become contagious. Yeah. So, <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> Um, so this project started, of course, with funding. So we, I was very lucky that I could get funding from the front, President of France and the Chancellors of Germany. It's, it's called the Isolt Project. Don't ask me why, but I, I, I can explain to you why I named this project Isolt, but anyway. Um, so we had an association with manufacturers. So the code name is Isolt. We have a big book. And the magnet uh, is very special in terms of its design. So it is really copy-paste from the magnet used for the, uh, for the CERN. Okay, it's not a solenoid. So it's made of uh, um, what we call double pancake design. This is very important to save on materials. We need less nobium titan. The problem is that homogeneity is not guaranteed. So we, ha we had to do a lot of uh, simulation to be sure. It's not a single strand, uh, it's, it's uh, an assembly of 10, the Y is an assembly of 10 uh, nobium titan uh, filaments, which were made in, by Louvata in, in the United States and shipped to France. And the magnet, of course, is huge, not because we have huge people in France, but because we, we need to have the gradients and everything, we need, we need some freedom with space. Um, the temperature will be down to 1.8 Kelvin, not 4.2, as done with conventional magnets. Uh, for two reasons, and the main reason, in fact, is that we want, uh, in case of production of local heat, the heat to be uh, dissipated instantaneously, so the helium will be superfluid. It's amazing to consider that uh, the temperature of the universe is 3K, which means that this magnet will function at temperature lower than the temperature of the universe. But in order to achieve that, we have to produce liquid helium on site, and uh, I'll show you that uh, on the next slide. So you see the numbers. Uh, we are working at 1,500 amps. The energy which is stored in the magnet is huge, 300 megajoule. For nuclear fusion magnets, it's about 600. So if we don't want to do uh, brain fusion, we have to be extremely careful, OK? <laughs> and the magnet is very heavy. The magnet was uh, made under, under our design, of course, in a French facility French called Alstom. This is where the very first uh, trains were built. And this is where we built uh, TGV. In a, it was in the next building. And um, these are the famous pancakes. Don't forget, it's a French magnet. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and it, I mean, the engineering for, for those pancakes is, is incredible. So we're using lasers to be sure that uh, they are completely flat. There are 168 of them. Uh, stacked in a cylinder and with an accuracy which is just incredible. And once the magnet will be on field, the forces will reach 8,000 tons and nothing should move. So you see, it's, it's really, really a tour de force. This magnet is also 
uh, actively shielded. Uh, otherwise, the field strength will go up, up to the Eiffel Tower. And the Eiffel Tower may, we have already problems with Notre Dame. We don't want to have problems with the Eiffel Tower as well. So uh, to avoid that, the, the magnet will be actively shielded. And that's why it is so, so big, in fact. So the magnet was completed in October 2017. The problem then was to transfer the magnet to Neurospin, which is southwest of uh, Paris. And uh, uh, that was not a trivial uh, matter because we could not go to highways. The bridges would be too small. And also we were a little bit anxious that the vibrations might damage uh, the magnet. So um, we put the magnet on a special truck with uh, two cabins, one to pull and one to push. If you count the number of wheels you have here, 150. You see, so it's really a big, <laughs> big truck. And the truck went to Strasbourg. So there are not two trucks, it's only one, okay, with, but with two cabins. And then it was uh, put on a boat on the Rhine River. So of course some of us, uh, not me, but some of my colleagues were traveling with a magnet to be sure nobody would steal our magnet, also it would be <laughs> difficult. <laughs> and the magnet went to, uh, to Germany on the Rhine River, to uh, Rotterdam, then to, uh, to the sea, back to the Seine River. So you see, it's quite, uh, quite interesting. <laughs> it went to the bridges of Paris, next to Notre Dame. And uh, the last step was to, uh, to have the magnet coming to cross uh, a tracks. And uh, we have, of course, electric lines. And we had to push the electric lines for the magnet to go through. You know, this line is called the RRB, House of Paris. It's a nightmare, it's always broken, there are always problems. So now people believe that it is our fault if, if trains <laughs> don't work well. And finally, it arrived on a rainy day uh, to, uh, to Neurospin. Uh, I mean, I was really, really moved when this magnet after, well, it was 17 years after my initial uh, thought that the magnet was delivered. But that was not it, because the, the magnet came like that, and these are the arches of Neurospin, and uh, we had to rotate the magnet, which is not easy, I can tell you, to put the magnet inside the, the arches and stabilize the magnet. So this, that took three weeks. So the magnet is there, now we have to make it working. So it's a very, very complicated instrument. This is a magnet, and underneath, as I said, we have a, a cryoplant to produce liquid helium ourselves. Uh, to feed the magnet continuously. Also, the magnet, for, for, because of this double pancake design, is not in a persistent mode. It is on an external power supply, which is a little bit weird for, for MRI. So we had to devise some stabilization systems. Also, we have to be sure that the helium is produced uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and so on. Don't forget, we're in France, a lot of vacation, strikes, <laughs> and uh, so, <laughs> This is completely automatic, so there are robots checking uh, with three sensors each time. So if one sensor says there is something wrong, we have to check if the two other sensors agree or not. And uh, so this is how it's done. And uh, if you want to have some more details about how it was, uh, the detail specifications and the making, I, I recommend this, this paper, which I wrote with uh, Thierry Shield. And uh, if you want to have some stories about the saga of this magnet, the last chapter of my book, uh, covers it. So um, this is for uh, for the magnet itself. Now I will not spend a lot of time on this slide because there are talks later which will cover this in a much better way than I would. But just to tell you that of course with a magnet you cannot do imaging. You need uh, many other uh, toys um, and uh, especially when you go to high field as you know, the homogeneity uh, of the uh, radio frequency field becomes an issue. We, in, with conventional MRI, we, we scan key space uh, using a Cartesian grid. As, as you know now, we are slowly but surely drifting from this paradigm. But at high field, there is another issue, which is uh, the uh, short wavelength um, that is uh, responsible uh, that came from the 500 megahertz, the operation frequency for this magnet. So we had already, we, are not, we have not wasted our time, we have devised some method 
to optimize the um, RF homo homogeneity to parallel uh, imaging, but I'm sure you, you are working on that, sparse sampling methods. So again, I will not talk a lot about that. Sparse sampling strategies, so um, uh, this is why, because you, you mentioned AI. AI, we, we often, I mean, uh, consider AI to analyze images, but as you know very well, of course, AI can be used, I think, in a better way to, to modify the way we acquire images or we encode signals for uh, image acquisition. We're also working on the new uh, color systems uh, to improve homogeneity, of course, but also to increase uh, uh, performance. And uh, we had a, a U, AU grant um, to, to look at uh, metamaterials to build uh, new kinds of coils, which are in fact uh, very, very promising. And um, this, is, uh, this has been called in, uh, in the media a success story, I don't know why, but anyway. So we, we are working with, uh, uh, with companies also, and all of this will be combined uh, for us to use our 11.7 Tesla. But in the meantime, this is, we, we are blind here. Is there a way we can explore this uh, space, this structure, this scale, uh, without high field? And yes, um, and of course that's what I have done all my life, is to use this trick which was uh, suggested by Einstein, which is to infer uh, things at a microscopic scale so you cannot see it. So uh, as you probably know, when Einstein published in 1905 his work on the diffusion theory, um, his interest was not so much diffusion, but it was to demonstrate that uh, there were atoms and molecules. In 1905, this was not a cried. So, I mean, the concept was not a cried. Some scientists denied the existence of atoms and molecules, which make us maybe laugh today, but it was a serious matter because some people say Boltzmann committed suicide because nobody would uh, listen to him. So you see, and Einstein um, considered that if we could demonstrate uh, the link between Brownian motion and, and uh, diffusion, it could have an indirect way to demonstrate the existence of atoms through the uh, theory of, of heat. So that's the scheme, if you like. Um, also, you cannot see the microscopic world using diffusion. You have some information about it. So this is how I came up with the idea of diffusion MRI back in, in the 80s. So this was the setup when I had more hair. This is the first MRI system that uh, France developed in Buc, in the uh, CGR. And the work uh, was done on the 0.35 Tesla MRI system. And this is a two Tesla system, but no gradient. I used the fringe field of the magnet to produce, and you could see, in fact, this, this, are the, uh, this is a diffusion spectrum. What is funny is that this photo, I was, I was not aware, was given to me by a friend who discovered it in a magazine of Air France in flight. Why? I have no idea. <laughs> but there was something about this institution, I guess. Anyway, so my, my point was that um, we got beautiful images. I mean, these are, from that, these are the original images from 1884, so not, not so bad. But of course, uh, uh, as a physician, it's not enough. You want, you want to understand what's the lesion uh, nature. So basically, your dream is to have access to histology in vivo, which is, of course, not, not possible. So my idea, knowing the work of uh, Einstein, was to consider Brownian motion. Um, if we look at uh, Einstein's paper, he himself uh, made some calculation. Now, it's not for water here. It's from particles in water. But the order of magnitude is correct. So if you use Einstein's equation and put a diffusion coefficient of water, you see that molecules, if they are free, which are not, of course, they will uh, travel on distances on a few micrometers in 50 milliseconds, which is the time frame we have with MRI. So that was it. I said, OK, if I can measure diffusion, I have the information I want. I, I want the water molecules will be like my spice. Then they will tell me what they've seen: fibers, the membranes, and so on. So it was a very naive idea, but it turned out to be extremely successful. So in fact, uh, Einstein's equation doesn't work in really uh, in vivo because we don't have free diffusion. Diffusion is hindered by those obstacles. That's why it works. In fact, for us. 
And, and by measuring uh, diffusion at, a, let's say, a diffusion time of 50 milliseconds, we have some contrast uh, revealing tissue microstructure. So you see, I copy-paste basically what Einstein tried to do for the theory of heat, but now is to look into tissues, not only the brain, uh, and, and get some information on the tissue microstructure. Also, the voxels are uh, on a one millimeter scale. So to do that, uh, I, um, I took the uh, Steschkal and Tanner sequence, and I mixed it with uh, the imaging sequence, which it was not trivial at the time, I can tell you. Today it looks natural, but it was not. And, and the idea is that in tissues where diffusion is fast, uh, molecules move a lot, which, uh, reduce, which uh, results in a, a lot of dephasing and a signal attenuation, while if molecules are diffusing more slowly, they, they don't move so much, Diffu and the phase shifts are, are less dispersed, and the signal attenuation is less. So, so this came to this paper. Uh, at that time, I was a student. I was a resident uh, in uh, neuroradiology, in a in PhD physics student. And uh, so I came up with this equation, and I said, well, uh, clinician we, we not like it. And in fact, they didn't like it anyway. But uh, <laughs> So I, I summarized this equation, uh, introducing what you know as a b-value. In fact, what you may not know, it's for my name. So the b-value is from behind. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, I knew also that D will not be the diffusion coefficient because uh, of uh, the uh, hindrance. So I call this the apparent diffusion coefficient, which means that this equation was derived taking Einstein's uh, framework. So, but the result is not the diffusion coefficient. It is something more complicated, which is the apparent diffusion coefficient. So this is called, this is also used in uh, weather forecasting. It's called uh, parametrization. So uh, then I published the very first images uh, in the brain and, and everything came uh, with time. And uh, even today, I'm, I'm even myself really, really surprised that it could be used for so many applications. So acute stroke, uh, fiber tracking, oncology, diffusion fMRI, recently uh, virtual elastography. If you look at, well, last year I looked at the web, there are one, one a million five hundred thousand citations for, for diffusion MRI. So it's really successful. I have no time today I have to check uh, to, to look at everything. So we, we take a few of those to explain something completely new, which I'm introducing to you here. Uh, it's, it's a little bit provocative, I have to say, but I think that's what you want, right? <laughs> okay, good. So, <laughs> so uh, a very important point here is that, as you know well, the ADC, diffusion coefficient, upon diffusion coefficient, decreases in the acute phase of stroke, and the reason for that is cytotoxic edema. So it's a swelling of uh, cells which lead to this decreased diffusion. Also, the mechanisms are not completely clear. There is a clear uh, relationship between cell swelling and decreased diffusion. We will use that a little bit later. And um, for diffusion fMRI especially, uh, this is exactly the hypothesis I have made, is that when cells get activated, they swell. When neurons get activated, they swell. I'll show you how. And this it leads to this uh, diffusion fMRI signal. So that's a famous slide where I'm talking about this. So if you look now at a microscopic scale, you have axons, and what is very important are the dendrites and the, um, uh, the, spinal, the, the spines that you have on each of the dendrites. The density is extremely high. Um, so this, this is absolutely enormous if you consider. So the, the bodies of the neurons, of course, there are many neurons in the brain, but what is more intriguing is the number of dendrites. And in fact, um, what is known is that it's not a static image. Dendrites, I mean, the spines uh, are moving, or moving, I mean, not, not, not moving in space, but they are uh, growing, shrinking all the time. So it's a dynamic effect. And uh, some people, when I give talks on diffusion fMRI, people say, no, it's no way, the neurons cannot swell, blah, blah, blah. But this is not true, of course. But what is even more interesting, if you, I like to go to history, like uh, Einstein, but at the same time, I mean, we are about this uh, very interesting time. Um, uh, Cajal said, neurons are the mysterious butterflies of the soul, which could one day reveal the secrets of our mental life. And he's completely right. So the state of activity would correspond to the swelling and elongation of the dendritic spines and the resting state, sleep or inactivity, to the retraction. 
This is exactly uh, uh, what is uh, what has what has driven my my push for diffusion fMRI. So this was the very first experiment we've done in visual cortex in humans. And what we see is that with diffusion MRI, so we just do diffusion during activation. For instance, here it's a 10 second uh, visual stimulation. Uh, the accuracy, I mean, the, the, special, the special accuracy is better than bold. But what is even more interesting is that you see the bold signal, the blue curve, is delayed compared to the activation, which is very well known. It's a hemodynamic response by a few seconds, a few seconds. So if you are a neuroscientist, you know, a few seconds is a lot, right? If you are a cognitive neuroscientist, maybe you don't care, but for neuroscience, it's an issue. And, uh, and for diffusion MRI, you see it's perfectly synchronized with the activation. So uh, the mechanism which we have proposed, and I have no time to go to the details today, um, is, is uh, that uh, the reason why cell swelling or, or dendrite swelling uh, leads to decreased diffusion is because uh, we believe that there is a layer of slow diffusing molecules attached or bound somewhat to the membranes, and, and it's a balance between if you have a, a, a membrane surface increase, you increase the amount of slow diffusion, and this gives you the impression that diffusion coefficient drops. Anyway, what I'd like you to, to keep in mind, because we need it a little bit later, is this cartoon, so which is based on diffusion fMRI and uh, the postulate from, uh, uh, from Carhal. Um, when the brain gets activated, so there is a lot of swelling occurring, when the brain is in a resting state, much less, and uh, when we are in a completely deactivated state, the amount of swelling is, is very low. Okay, so this is now how we can build, I, I will not give you today the brain gauge theory, but just the direction. So we are set with many brain regions, I said, I said before perhaps 200, okay? And the idea is that maybe we have a neural code. Um, that means if you consider the genetic code, the code is, is based on the three-dimensional organization uh, within the DNA, right? In the visual cortex, as I showed earlier, there is an organization, a very precise organization, genetically programmed organization of cells, which is responsible for a particular function. So the idea is that um, all of those small knots, I don't know how to call them, clusters, whatever, knots, let's say a few thousand of neurons, they all code for a specific function, right? And um, for instance, uh, so they are genetically programmed, but they are functions which cannot be carried out. You know the QR codes, they are produced by computers, so programmed by humans. But even if you spend thousands of hours, you, are, you cannot read QR codes. The human brain cannot read QR codes. So that means that we don't have the circuit for that. So the idea is that we have a set of uh, circuits, and uh, uh, we hope that by going to high field MRI, we have enough accuracy in space, this is seven Tesla only, to see the uh, cytoarchitectony, so some information about the three-dimensional organization of neurons inside uh, the, on, the, on the cortex in the basal ganglia. Good, that's one step, but that's not enough. If you give uh, children, very young children, iPhones, or well, I don't want to make commercial, so let's say smartphones, uh, <laughs> Uh, in a f very quickly, they, they, they can make something out of it, right? If you give your smartphone to your grandmother, it might take more time, right? So what's going on? I mean, there is no, uh, no, no um, special region for uh, smartphones in the brain, I guess. There's no genetic uh, organization for smartphones. It's just that the kids will combine different regions of, of the cortex they will synchronize several regions of the cortex to assume uh, a given uh, functions, which are, they are not even aware. They just try randomly, right? So I think this points out to the importance of white matter in the brain, and I think it has been overlooked. We consider always the cortex, but I think the white matter might be even more important than the cortex. This is a very interesting study, which was published very recently, where uh, our colleagues have compared the ratio of um, some structures to the overall cerebrum. So you see that among species, from uh, mice to humans, um, the ratio of uh, gray matter to the cerebrum is, is almost constant. 
What makes a huge difference is the quantity of white, of white matter in the cerebrum. So that's, that is a clue that we should consider. I'll, I'll skip that. But the idea is that, uh, which I will introduce uh, slowly, if I have time, yeah, um, is that uh, gray matter is responsible for special encoding. That means that it's a special organization of, uh, of the cells uh, which will code for, diff or for precise functions at a basic level. And white matter is res responsible for temporal encoding. So that means how information can transfer from one node to another one uh, with, a, with a proper time frame for uh, synchronization. And uh, white matter, of course, can be explored with diffusion MRI. You know that very well. Um, um, so because of the discovery, we are very lucky, that water diffusion uh, is anisotropic in, in, uh, in the white matter. So water molecules diffuse uh, more easily along the axons than in the perpendicular direction. So in uh, 1991, so that, that was shown by Mike Mosley at UCSF, that was anisotropy. So in 1991, with my, radio, uh, with my uh, um, resident, Philippe Dweck, who came to NIH to work with me, we showed that we could reverse the ID. So instead of saying, well, there is an isotropy, we measured diffusion in two perpendicular directions. And uh, with that, we could, uh, we could obtain images showing uh, the direction of the, of the fibers. Uh, very soon later, uh, I met Peter Basser we, uh, at the post fair. So posters are very important. Um, at the post of at NIH, and he was working on the diffusion of ions and on a theoretical uh, uh, framework. So we decided to work together. This is our postdoc, James Mattiello, and we designed the DTI framework. So we, well, we have uh, many, many uh, uh, directions, minimum six. So the two, the, the two papers we published together have been cited uh, more than 8,000 times, which means that this, this is something really uh, which was. Uh, uh, interesting for, for our, our community. And uh, soon later, as you know, um, we were able to obtain images of uh, the orientation of the fibers within each voxel, and using a computer algorithm, um, most often taken from artificial vision, uh, obtained those beautiful images. So I've seen yesterday that uh, you have also piece, uh, of pieces of art. Uh, showing the connections in the brain, showing that uh, babies are already connected. We can see somewhat the short connections, but I mean, they are not, not really uh, so small. And with some uh, hardware, such as the Siemens uh, Connectome Gradients uh, hard system, which unfortunately we don't have at Neurospin, uh, we can get a very high uh, accuracy in, in to visualize those fibers. And, I mean, by chance, I had this on my slides, mm -hmm. that it can be used to make ni nice uh, fashion accessories, <laughs> or, <laughs> or even in one of the Paris metro station, and I've seen that here you have also the same. Okay, so this, this is good, but what could we do with that? Um, you are probably also familiar with uh, this early work, uh, showing that, in fact, the brain is organized with hubs. Uh, so the connections converge or diverge at specific regions. Okay, that's anatomy. Now, with functional MRI, there is what we call resting state fMRI, where we can see which regions of the brain are communicating. So if, if they have a particular time pattern, uh, which is similar, we consider that they are probably talking to each other. That's functional connectivity. Um, I think uh, we have to consider that uh, there is no structural connectivity and functional connectivity. That's what you find very often in, in papers, including in this one. It's just that we don't have the accuracy to see structural connectivity at such a low level that uh, we, can, we can match it with functional connectivity. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is that we have knots, and those knots are connected. And look at this very recent paper now, which is extremely interesting. People have looked at uh, uh, functional and structural connectivity in volunteers and patients. So in normal controls, uh, there are many, many uh, um, connections uh, opt that, we c that can be seen with, with, uh, with fMRI. While at the op opposite extremity of the spectrum, vegetative state patients have a very poor uh, connectomes, if you like. They, they don't have a lot of connections. 
uh, uh, I will skip this because they, they try to suggest that uh, in, in uh, control people, there are more functional connections than, uh, than uh, anatomic connection, and that's opposite for, uh, for vegetative state uh, patients. But I think it's some, I will not say an artifact, but it's just because we don't have the resolution to see uh, the connections. But this is very important. So what, what seems the message here, uh, if you read between the lines, uh, it's not really the cortex which is responsible for this state. It's that the connections are, are, are not there, right? Now, if you do the opposite, you you give some. It's not my study, but it was done <laughs> by some other groups. They gave some uh, very uh, active psychoactive drugs, and and you see that the connections get uh, get really a, a lot, and just by by that. So, so this is now what I'm. The new concept, the new framework, so don't take me wrong, it, it's just a framework to, to which could give some light about, uh, especially psychiatric disorders, um, how uh, time and connections are important uh, for the brain. So this is the brain. We, we feel the world through our body, eyes, ears, we touch, whatever. But clearly, if I touch the screen, it, it, it takes some time for the information to, to go into my brain. Then the brain will do something about it. For instance, I want to, to, to put the screen off, okay? So uh, this is possible because not only I had to wait for the information to go to my brain, visual, tactile, and so on, also to mix up these uh, events with what I had experienced before, so I know what off means, means, otherwise I could not do anything, right? And also what I will memorize here will be used later. So you see, there is a really a very wide uh, time frame, and uh, uh, what I think we should consider is that present doesn't exist in our brain. Um, in fact, what we do is that we take information from the past and we predict something which is related to the future. So that's what I try to express here, that the brain makes future images of the world to act on the past images it's received. So I don't know, probably you have, you experience that very often if you don't have a very fast internet connection. Let's say I have tactile screen, screen. I want to hit something, and by the time I hit it, the screen has changed to something else, and I click to something which I don't like, right? So it's the same. So when the brain is trying to act, it, it's already too late. Um, so it's, we're already catching up with time. So look at this uh, figure, okay? You, it's very well known, so you can see a, a vase, or you can see two faces, right? Now, this is an experiment which we, we did long ago already. We present this uh, image for a very short time, um, 150 milliseconds, and then we hide it. And we ask subjects to press left or right, depending if they think they have seen a vase or uh, faces. And this is very intriguing result. Um, if we look at one area which is specialized in, in the recognition of faces, what we can see uh, is that when the image appears at time zero, if this area is activated for other regions, you will see faces. If this area is not activated, you will see a face. So basically, you do not decide, right? It is decided for, for you. So how is that possible? So the idea I'm introducing is this, we have basically all those nodes have different clocks and um, they all have in, independent activity. And uh, we have brain lights, geodesics, for instance. So uh, there are two choices. We can go along this line and we see uh, a vase or we can go out on this line and see uh, faces. So if you think about physics, that means we are in a, in a universe, if you like, or where the, the pathway will go along the lines which are the easiest. So this one was already activated, then this is what uh, the brain considers as an easier solution. So if we go along the line um, and, uh, and we go back to Einstein, um, I'm, what I'm proposing now is a little bit, not a little bit, it's really provocative, but you know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm used to that. When I introduced the um, IVIM MRI, the idea was to model uh, blood flow in micro, in capillaries as a pseudo diffusion process. When I started that at NIH, you know, I was, uh, people were laughing at me, uh, it's not possible, I mean, this is not diffusion, blah, blah, blah. Some, some of my colleagues had uh, made special t-shirts, diffusion, 
Perfusion, confusion. Okay. <laughs> so I'm used, I'm vaccinated, as we say in, in French. <laughs> But so now, uh, and uh, by the way, if you are interested, there is this uh, book that we have published and, uh, with Dr. Ima uh, on, I, on IVIM MRI. So people laughed at me, but today this uh, IVIM MRI is used uh, widely. Anyway, so what I'm proposing now is to model uh, the circulation of, uh, of flow, let's call it like that, in the brain as a pseudo diffusion process. Of course, it's not diffusion, okay? But pseudo diffusion process. Um, and, um, then when I, when I did that, I, I, I realized that there was a, maybe a problem. The speed along the axons is limited. There is a speed limit, um, and the speed limit depends on, for instance, the myelination. Long fibers are uh, extremely myelinated, so the uh, time goes a little bit faster than in short, uh, in short connections when the myelination is, is less. Okay, so there is a speed limit let's say C star, which is of course much less than the, uh, the speed of light. But we might consider that it's something related to relativity, except we don't use C now, but it's something else. So the, 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 the Lorentz transformation, of course, will not apply here. It's, a, it's an analogy, okay? Don't get me wrong to that. I don't want to say the brain is relativist, but uh, it, we have to consider that. So I went back to the Einstein's paper on, on diffusion, and then I was shocked to discover that he completely forgot that. So he published a few months apart a paper on the theory of relativity and another one on diffusion, but they are not compatible. So uh, if you look at the integrals, you assume that uh, the velocities could be from minus infinity to plus infinity. So I was really surprised, so I went to the web, and uh, uh, it's not a hallucination, I'm not the only one to have seen that. And in fact, it's extremely complicated, and, and the solutions have been found only very recently, so last year. <laughs> And uh, this is what it looks like. So again, it's, uh, this, this curve was obtained using the Lorentz transform. Uh, and uh, as I said, the Lorentz transform will not be applied to the brain. It's just to give you an idea about uh, what happens when diffusion becomes relativistic. There is a speed limit. So this, this is basically Einstein's uh, equation I showed earlier. So the diffusion distance depends on the square root of time. So that means it's flat. But if we are now, if we are in a, in a domain where we are close to the speed limit, you see that it breaks and, and the diffusion distance becomes much less. So if we want to avoid that, if we want the information to flow fast in the brain, we have to make it uh, such that the maximum velocity is high and what I call D star here is low. And in fact, it is exactly what the brain does. Uh, these are studies which have been performed in babies. Uh, evoke potentials, vo visual evoke potentials. So when you stimulate visually uh, the baby and you record the electrical uh, activity, electrical activity in the, in the back of the brain, we see that when the baby gets older, uh, the time gets shorter, the latency gets shorter. And when we use a diffusion DTI, the MRI, so using the functional anisotropy functional anisotropy as, a, as an index of maturation and malination, we see it's correlated. So basically, this maximum velocity, which I call C star, is increased by the brain during the malination process. The second point is that if you, let's say you take a baby, baby's brain, so randomly, the baby is trying, like use a smartphone, is, so the information is, is, is uh, flowing in the brain randomly, but by learning, some circuits now are, are stabilized, and this will also increase the velocity for the information to flow. And you know that pruning occurs within two years of age, so babies can do everything, and at some point they do less. A typical example are Japanese uh, uh, babies who at birth can distinguish R and L, but after one year of age, they can't anymore. So wrong and long, they don't hear the difference because it's not necessary. So when we become adults, we lose this flexibility. Our brains become stiffer. And I will now do a, an experiment with you. I will show you a photo. The photo is about uh, Canadian militaries going to a flight, okay? But in fact, there are two photos alternating. And there is a small difference between the two photos. So what I'm asking you is to raise your hand when you see the difference, but you don't say what you've seen, okay? Let's, let's try. I think it's a little bit fast. Usually on my laptop, it's not so fast. But. So when you, when you see a difference between the two, you raise your hand. 
Come on, Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. <laughs> no? Ah, good. I mean, there's just like this yellow. Shh, don't they, don't they, don't they, don't they. <laughs> Okay, I will look at the engine engine here. Okay, it's there or not there, <laughs> right? Okay, you see, after one minute, you still have not seen it, right? About 20 years ago, I, I was invited to give a talk at my uh, daughter's school, so 10 years uh, kids, and I showed this um, for fun. So I ask the same, when you, when you see the difference, you raise your hand. In 10 seconds, every, all the kids raise their hands. In 10 seconds. I mean, this, I mean I'm, I'm very happy that my daughter is such a <laughs> good, good school. No, in fact, just children, they explore everything. As adults, we know, we think we know. So once you see the first image, your brain says, okay, I know. And then you cannot see the difference. So it's always the same. I mean, some of you, I'm sure live in houses, or, or they have two, two stories in their apartment. So you, do, do you have that? So if you have a stair, OK? So sort of you have stairs in the, in the apartment house. Could you see the stair? OK? You see the stair every day. You use it every day, perhaps. OK? Now the question I'm asking you, visualize. Do, do your best to see the stairs. How many stairs do you have? You cannot do it, right? The information has never entered your brain. I bet tonight you will count the stairs and then you will remember for your life. Okay? <laughs> so this is, this is the problem with the brain. If I start the problem, it is the way it is, it is organized. And uh, what we, I, I don't have time to go to the details here, but the idea is that this, the way the information with the pseudo diffusion is, is working depends a lot on uh, what other regions will impose. So, uh, so in, in, in the vegetative state, some connections are there, but once we add uh, the attention and everything, the, the network will change. So we will deform the connections. So let me show you uh, what might happen. So the, the pseudo diffusion coefficient here, I'm just copy, uh, taking from, from uh, uh, physics. So the D star now will be related to the, the firing rate and divided by uh, what we call the cross section in physics. So the, 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 size, the size of the area, which is the activity, and of course the density of the nodes. So the, the message here is that the brain space scales as the square root of time. No need to rush, okay? So we, <laughs> we are slow. Um, so now I will develop a little more this concept. So in terms of physics, that means we have uh, some uh, geodesics. And I don't know if you are familiar with the Minkowski diagrams, which were introduced by, in 1908 to visualize uh, relativity, because that was uh, not so easy, it's still not so easy. So the idea, uh, uh, this is a very powerful concept, uh, which are called the light cones. So in, in the universe, we cannot travel uh, faster than the speed of light. That means if we take uh, this uh, uh, space-time event, okay, it's a special location somewhere in the universe we, at a given time, it is related, it is it is, uh, we can find associations with events which are only within these past cones. Because only those who, who could be connected with a speed inferior to C can be connected. Same for the future. This time event cannot be connected to something there, right? So now, um, again, it's an analogy. Don't take me wrong. I think that if we assume that there is this uh, diffusion uh, uh, time, uh, space-time framework, we replace ct by d star t, square root of d star t, but it is the same now. We, we have each node of the brain, which is connected at a given time to some regions of the brain, but not all of them, only those we are, which are compatible with the speed limit of the uh, axonine connection. So basically, do you see the cones? It doesn't work. So you, you see, basically, each, each node at a given time has its cone, and the information will flow to the brain, and to be perceived by the brain, it has to be within uh, this framework. So that, I, I would say, corresponds to the normal state of, of the brain. Now, if we take patients which are in a vegetative state, or do anesthesia, unconscious, as we've seen, there are less connections. So one possible explanation is that 
they are, these, these poor connections are because we are now in the relativistic domain for diffusion. So in, in the equation which is here, gamma is low. That means these people, for their nodes, the nodes are working well, but the connections between each node are, are much less possible now. So less will happen in, in the brain. So um, uh, the idea is to see, for instance, that an event which is plausible in a, in a normal brain will no longer be possible if we are in, in this state. The same, the same events. So let me give you an example now. So it's a continuum. We can go from one to the next. If I show you for a very short time uh, uh, words such as lion for 300 milliseconds, but it is masked by two random characters. We know that it is called subliminal uh, perception. So you are not aware that you have seen the word. But with fMRI, we can see that the, uh, uh, the sum region, including the Wernicke area, has been activated and a little bit the Broca area. So in this case, we are in this configuration when the information is coming into your brain but cannot, cannot go to the right direction because um, uh, we lack the connections. Now if I switch just a little bit um, by removing the, the, the mask, then you are aware, oh, it's lion. And then what, is, what you see is that more reg wrong regions get activated. So now we go to this, to this part. So that, that's the idea why I have introduced this framework is to um, to see how the brain, so comp that's very different from the universe. In the universe, you have only one speed of light. Here, the, sp the maximum speed, in fact, is, uh, of course, comes from the organization and the maturation of the brain, the pruning, everything. But you can modulate this by, uh, by uh, attention, for instance. So this scheme might explain, uh, maybe, some psychiatric disorders. Let's take uh, schizophrenia, for instance. Uh, where it has been shown that the connections between the frontal cortex and the temporal cortex are somewhat faulty. Uh, fractional anisotropy is decreased and so on. So we know that there is a hypothesis about this connection for, for schizophrenia. So if I go now to this uh, uh, light cones, which now we can call the brain line cones, so in a, in, a normal, in a normal subject, this is what could happen. Again, it is a scheme. It's very provocative, the scheme. When you, when you consider schizophrenic patients, many of them hear voices, right? Uh, and and we look at, uh, when we look at the uh, auditory cortex, there, there are activation in, in the auditory cortex, which means that they are really hearing voices. But we also talk to, to each other all the time. When, you, when we read, or, so we talk to, our, to, to ourselves, and we are not surprised. So again, this is very, very gross, but just to simplify the idea, so let's say that in our prefrontal cortex, something comes, which is a, a thought, we are not aware. Then it will go to the auditory cortex, and uh, when it has to materialize, if you like, and then it is perceived perhaps by uh, some language areas, such as Wernicke areas, to say, okay, this is, this is a message. So, but everything is within the cone, so it's no problem. Now, if you consider uh, the action potential traveling along those lines, so uh, between the two events, uh, we, we go from tau 1 to tau 0, right? So now uh, I am an action potential traveling from the pre prefrontal cortex to the auditory cortex. So this is what I see. So I am within the cone, that's no problem. Now you see that according to the theory of relativity, the, the time difference between the prefrontal cortex and the temporal cortex is a little bit shorter. That's what we know from relativity theory, but now we are in the brain. Now I take a schizophrenic patient. Schizophrenic patients, they have maybe, because of the faulty connection, the maximum velocity is much less. The cones is reduced. I take exactly the same situation. The information comes from the prefrontal cortex, goes to the auditory cortex, and to the Wernicke area. However, now, because of this reduction in, in the cone, you can see that in the time frame of the action potentials traveling, the uh, information coming from the prefrontal cortex arrives later than the activation in the, in the temporal lobe. That means these people will hear something and later realize that it is language. So they, they cannot make the relationship that what they hear comes from the prefrontal cortex. So that's a hypothesis, of course. So basically, that means that they hear something and they believe somebody is talking to them because it, it is not them. So you see, by, by looking at this relativity difference, we might have some uh, interpretation about 
how, how this synchrony, if you like, in the brain might explain some, some hallucinations, visual or auditory. So basically, inner voices are perceived as external voices because they are not part of, of the scheme. Now, if we look at uh, autism, it's very similar. Um, in, in autism, you know, we have, um, uh, it has been shown that uh, there are uh, connections which are also uh, faulty. And uh, unfortunately, at a very young age, so the DTI is used uh, as, a, as a marker, if you like, uh, to check uh, for possible uh, um, autism spectrum disorders. And in the, in the group of uh, Professor Sadato in Japan, they have devised this, uh, this system where two people are in two parallel magnets, two three Tesla, and they are shown a video uh, to interact with each other. So basically, I see the eyes of the uh, other fellow in the other magnet and vice versa. So what they've shown is that if um, you delay the video, so you record the video, but you shift it by, let's say, 20 seconds, you, you don't feel well. You, you see that uh, what you are saying to the other person in the other magnet is, is something wrong. So the interaction becomes wrong visually. So we'll try to, to, ex to, uh, to understand why. And in fact, there are, there are regions uh, which have been seen to be activated uh, in, uh, in the limbic motor system, in the cerebellum especially. And uh, if, if I am right, and maybe I'm completely wrong, okay, but if I am right, that means that those regions are trying to correct for the time difference. So they are curving the space of the connections. So this will be my last slide uh, to explain that, uh, in fact, this network of um, connectivity in the brain uh, can be seen as uh, something where we can, we, can, we can act on it. Now, again, this, this is a face, the two faces in the, vis, in the vase. Now, by, 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 by will, you can decide what you want to see, right? So by, by attention, you can force the information to flow in one direction or the other. That means you are basically somewhat curving this brace time. You are, you are putting weight to, to curve it so that the, info, the, the, uh, the flow will follow a uh, given uh, pathway. So there are regions of the brain which are probably uh, more important to curve this uh, space time, like the, like the thalamus. And uh, last example I want to show you, you are probably aware of this uh, uh, study published long ago about a young woman who was in a vegetative state. And um, when asking her, she was placed in fMRI setting, could you uh, give us your name? Of course, there was no response, but the broker areas were activated. Could you think you are, you are traveling in your home, you are navigating in your home? This is what was seen with fMRI, which is very similar to what a normal person will do. But this person was in a vegetative state. So again, the brain is working, the nodes are working, they are not communicating. So basically, this person is in this state. Is there a way we could wake up this patient to make, to make the brain more curved? So is there a way we can manipulate uh, the thalamus, for instance? So that's the idea. If we, if we put some energy, we induce some swelling in the dendrites of this area of the brain, we might have a chance to, 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 to change the state from this point to that one. Of course, it's a challenge, but I tried. Not in humans, of course, at this stage, but in animals. So this is, we tried in rats. The rats are anesthetized. That means that, uh, according to my scheme, they are in this situation. This is a thalamus. We know that the thalamus has some, in fact, more, more precisely, the central median nucleus of the thalamus. And we know that uh, this nucleus has connections. And the idea was, uh, using a canyon, to, um, to, to control the amount of swelling. So to block swelling completely using ferrosemide, or to induce spontaneous swelling using a hypotonic CSF. We cannot inject water because water is toxic to, to brain tissue, but hypotonic CSF. And this is what happened. So, so the, the rat is anesthetized, and you see the animal wakes up just when we inject uh, the hypotonic solution. So uh, one interpretation, of course, again, I may be completely off, completely wrong. That's a, the point is that what we, we try to do here is to manipulate some parts of the brain to, uh, to, to curve the connection, to curve the space of the connections, so basically to go from this state to that state. Okay, so in fact, uh, quantitatively, 
we could, moni we could uh, change the, uh, the concentration of the uh, hypotonic CSF or change the concentration of the ferrosemite, so modulate the amount of swelling, plus or minus, and, and this would change the threshold for the animal to, to wake up. So if this is right, that means that we might have ways at some, in some days to, uh, to wake up patients in vegetative state. Of course, the idea is not to put uh, something in the brain, but uh, with using focused ultrasounds, perhaps, we have a way mechanically to, to stimulate some parts of the brain and, and have this, uh, these patients go out of uh, a vegetative state. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Stay here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for that illuminating, thought provoking, and kind of life changing talk. <laughs> like, I think we're all wondering what the maximum velocity of our brains are now. <laughs> You've got us wondering. <laughs> but uh, really, really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you so much. That My was pleasure. amazing. I'm afraid to ask a question about a minor thing in this magnificent talk, but um, for, the, for the functional diffusion, can you just explain a little bit more about this surface waters? And, and yes, yes. Uh, so um, we have done experiments at uh, 17 Tesla uh, in aplasia. In aplasia, cells are, neurons are quite big, so we are cheating a little bit, but that's single neuron fMRI. So, and we measure diffusion, the co-diffusion coefficient. So, microscopically, first, we see that when neurons are activated, for instance, using uh, a dopamine, they swell. So, this is, this is a crazy idea, neurons swell. Now, if we measure the diffusion coefficient uh, inside the cytosol, we see that the ADC increases, which is, which is obvious because there is a dilution effect, right? If the cell increases, uh, uh, we expect the diffusion to go up. But what I showed before in humans <coughs> and is that the diffusion coefficient goes down. And in fact, now if we take not, on, not just uh, the cytosol, but we take a region of interest surrounding um, uh, the, the neurons, we find that the ADC goes down. So uh, if we calculate uh, the amount of extracellular space and so on, it's quite easy because we, we see it. It doesn't work. So th 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 the sch scheme I'm, I'm proposing is, is that there, there is a layer of uh, slow diffusing water bound to the membranes. So when we have soil swelling, there is just an increase of the slow amount of diffusing water, which gives the impression that the ADC goes down. Now, if we go to uh, I think this, no, yeah, this slide, um, I have proposed that already long ago, and there is a controversy. Some people think that uh, uh, water molecules can be bound only up to two layers of water molecules. But other groups deny that, and they have shown, for instance, that it could extend to, uh, here you see, 180 nanometers. So this is what I don't talk too much about it, because there is a controversy about, about how much bound water there is. But uh, we, not, we should not consider only uh, the, the membrane itself. I mean, next to the membrane, you have uh, tons of uh, molecules attached, which all have uh, sites for the water molecules to bind. So, so this concept is just that uh, it's, it's true for diffusion fMRI, but it's true also for cell swelling in acute stroke. That um, the idea is that we are maybe sh we should not look at geometric effects. So, sh if cell uh, size increases, there is less extracellular space and so on. But something more functional, which is the amount of bound water to membranes. So, the, is the idea of structured water required to explain? The that's one explanation, one possible explanation. Yes, that's not the only one, but that's my favorite one. <laughs> that's why I like this uh, movie, The Shape of Water. Great movie. Yes. So you're talking about these cones in uh, wake state and vegetative. Where does sleep fall into there? Is it, is it the same? I'm sorry, what? Sleep. Ah, sleep. Ah, that's a very good question. Um, so let's go back to... That's a very good question. In fact, I, I don't know yet. This is quite a recent. Uh, um, um, in sleep, as, as you know, the knots are, are extremely activated, more than in a, in a wake state. But something is blocking, um, is, is blocking the connections. But there are connections. Um, so I think that we are probably in, in, in this situation here, but this star becomes extremely low. But so basically, in the, in the, in the, in the sleeping state, uh, as the activity is, is high, as we know it, the cross-section, that means the 
the equivalent cross section, again, this is an analogy. I don't, don't quote me on this. I, I just copy paste physics equation directly. It's just to, to give you the impression. So, so sigma uh, will increase a lot. This star will, will go down, which means that uh, if, you, if you write that, if you look at this, uh, at these equations here, we are functionally in this state. So it's not because of a disease. It's that the brain, at some point, has a mechanism to shut off uh, the connections. So the brain is extremely active. Also, you, you know probably these people who have uh, experienced, I don't know how, how it is called in English, but um, near-death near uh, sensations. So people uh, have a stroke and, uh, and uh, after it, longs, uh, it, it, it lasts a long time, but they are still, uh, still alive and they, they say they have seen something. And if you look at, uh, there are thousands of reports like that, people report always almost the same things. So it could be that uh, the brain is trying to shut down the connections because this is what is the most uh, costly in terms of energy. So to, to preserve energy, the connections, so the brain puts itself in this uh, situation, but each node works well. well. Meditation also could correspond to, to, the, to this scheme. So what is so nice is that in the universe, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, there is only one C. Well, in the brain, uh, C star uh, can be modulated uh, by will or by treatment, maybe. So if, if this crazy uh, ID works, we might have uh, some new uh, ideas for to, to process, uh, um, to repair uh, faulty uh, connections. That's what I'm, tr I'm trying to, to show with this uh, funny diagram here. I, I have a question. So, uh, is there a way to um, identify the nodes that are key to that sort of... Um yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So for autism, for instance, uh, we have already identified in normal subjects regions which are basically trying to, to increase the mass, to, to curve, to correct for the, the, fate, for the time delay. So we, we will do now some experiments where in autism, uh, autist uh, patient, to see that if we can, for instance, by uh, a neurofeedback, train them to, uh, to increase the activity in those knots, which might help. You know, it has been done for, for, for pain, uh, neuronal feedback, so people uh, watch uh, any, anything, uh, uh, an activity which is linked to the activity of, of some specific regions of the brain, and the pain goes away, right? Not, or, not to all patients, but it could. So that's the idea here. Once you have identified those knots which are curving this rest time, rest, um, space time in the brain, we might have a way to help those patients it's a dream. But, uh, yeah. yeah, could be useful for deep brain stimulation. Yes. Oh, yes. So, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Deep brain stimulation is something we're investigating as well. Yes. Great. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Okay. Well, thank you so much, oh. and we've opened up your gift for you. Oh, so good. <laughs>